Hi everyone, welcome back, um, or welcome if you're joining us for the first time. Um, we're just getting set up here, so we just started a couple of minutes early to make sure everything's working. So thank you for joining us. And I'm Simon Walker, I'm Director of Training for Maxon, and we've got Chad Perkins, or the amazing Chad Perkins, I should say, on the line. So welcome, thank Chad. You. Thank you for saying that, Simon, I appreciate that. <laughs> and this is uh, this is such a great session that we've got going because, um, as you reminded us before, you wrote the user guides for, for uh, many of these effects and did a whole bunch of the tutorials on it. So this uh, we're definitely learning from the source. <laughs> this oh, is great. So hi, Celio, welcome back. And what I'll do is, I mean, if you come before, you know the score, but we're, we're recording this and you get the link automatically afterwards. But I've got some um, info for you. So we'll, I'll post that here. So the recording, and also if you wanted to, here we are, wanted to look at the PDF that I'm showing here, which is a list of the various techniques that Chad's gonna run through. Please have a look at the chat section. Then is the download link for that one. And um, the, the usual thing, if you click on a previous link, then that gives you access to the previous recording. So if you missed anything from yesterday, please feel free to view either of those recordings by clicking on yesterday's info. And um, you should be seeing my screen and hearing me. So that if you're not, let us know in the questions area box. And one other quick thing I wanted to share with you is that we're doing these presentation, all these webinars every Monday as well. And we've got another series of them. I'll just show you what's going on with these. And Oh, thank you, Dale. Thanks for the nice comment. The, uh, it's, our, it's our pleasure. We're more than happy to be hosting these. So we, I'll just give you the link for this. But basically, we're doing another whole series of webinars on different topics. So these are in additional to the ones that Chad's running this week and every Monday throughout the next three months. And most likely through the rest of the year, we'll be running these. And um, the link is inside the notes for this particular setup. If you want to join these, please just download that PDF. I'll tell you more about it as we go through and maybe at the end, I'll give a little reminder to everyone. But the idea is just to keep giving you information about things that we found useful and things that could help. And the format we're doing for these demystifying ones is jumping in and doing it like an interactive chat with each of our industry experts who will be joining us every week. Great. So um, what else have I forgotten? <laughs> We've ticked it all off. We're recording this. Here are the webinars. Oh, yes. Another couple of things that I think you might find interesting, um, one of which, by the way, is that these webinars are, here we are, they're available uh, as a list on the Red Giant website. So in fact, I could put this link in, couldn't I? That would be there. Here we go. So there's, they're on, they're on the, um, the blog, on the Red Giant blog. And also, if you hadn't seen it, we have a whole series of certification exams for Red Giant tools. So for, for Trap Code and VFX and Universal Magic Bullets, you can take these free exams and then it will test your knowledge. And if you don't get any of the answers right or if you get some of the answers wrong, it links you at the end to answers to those or where you can find out more. So that's just something that could be useful. I'll just add a little link to this in the notes. How are we doing? Right on the top of the hour. Good stuff. Just wanted to start a couple of minutes early to get the housekeeping done so we give enough time for Chad to show us all his amazing tricks. Great. So um, talking of which, I'm going to switch over to Chad's um, screen. So let me do that. Let me switch over to you. Here we go. So if I make you the presenter. And you're on top of it today, Simon. This is... <laughs> it's almost like we've done this before a few times, isn't it? It's like one minute after, and like they're seeing my screen. You're like, it's clockwork. <laughs> it's like, absolutely. Um, great. And oh, yes, the other thing I was going to say, just a final little thing, I forgot to say, I knew there was something. If you need um, any feedback, if any of those links aren't working or you want to watch previous sessions and you can't get hold of the PDF, please let me know. Training at maxon.net. I'll type that into the chat window, but um, that's how you can get hold of us. Fantastic, great. Oh yes, last thing. If there's a slight lag on any of the audio and video, usually that's because of an internet connection and the recording records at the source, at the servers, so you don't get any lag on the recording. But uh, we try and 
minimize these things by um, turning off everything else in, <laughs> in the background, including my webcam. So I'm going to switch this off so I'm not hogging any of your bandwidth. Chad, here we go. Stop sharing. Uh, another thing you usually mention too is about like Darren and questions and that whole bit. Do you want to shout out to <laughs> yes. Darren? Yes, questions? please. Yes. The we got Darren who is absolutely Darren's organizing and answering questions that we go through. And there's that little question area inside the software. Please uh, feel free to ask questions for that. And also you should be able to see Chad's screen there. So if you can, please just give us a little hi on the questions area to make sure it's all working and that'd be that'd be great. Cool. So well, over, over to you, Chad. Sweet. Here we go. All right. Well, we're going to be covering a bunch of things today. Yesterday, we looked at 3D objects, getting 3D objects from uh, Cinema 4D and After Effects and a few different ways to do that. I think, you know, when you're talking about Cinema 4D, those are the, the, the tricks that everyone talks about. But as I've been playing around with this, I've noticed that there are a few other unconventional things that we can do to get stuff from Cinema 4D into After Effects. And, and these aren't just really Cinema 4D tricks necessarily because it's about using Cinema 4D strengths with trap code stuff. So we're gonna be looking at uh, some stuff to take from Cinema 4D. There's a, a content browser and when you install Cinema 4D and then you get it working and it's really fast and you're super amazed. And then there's an, a super huge download afterwards of all this stuff that takes a long time. Uh, and Cinema 4D like restarts a bunch of times during that process. Uh, that's the content browser. That's the extra like bunch of assets that you get. And there's a bunch of stuff there that, um, you know, if you haven't checked out before, it's really incredible. And then there's also some spline stuff in Cinema 4D that's really incredible. And then we also have maps and textures in Cinema 4D that we could use in After Effects. Now on their own, these things are great. Like if this was a Cinema 4D tutorial, these things would still be you know, cool to, to dig into. But specifically, they're applicable here because we're going to be taking these things and using them with trap code products. And some trap code products, you know, you know are, like, are pretty well known and widely used, particular and such. And then, you know, you start getting into like form and then mirror, and that's kind of like a little bit more obscure. And today, we're going to be talking about things like Ecto and DAO and stuff that's not uh, as common. And we're going to be using this stuff from Cinema 4D there. So. Um, some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, we're going to be making this like a clip scene and we're going to be talking about trap code, like I said, trap code DAO, which is, I think, really underutilized. It's this gorgeous um, plugin that's full of mystery and wonder. <laughs> and then we'll also look at uh, creating 3D text right here in uh, After Effects with the Cinema 4D engine that's built in. So just very quickly looking at that just to make sure that we know that that is there. Okay, I'm gonna hop over to Cinema 4D. I got a, a, a naked project here and I can go over to the content browser tab. And you know, this is a collection of just really great assets, presets, whole scenes. So for learning Cinema 4D, it's fantastic. And also for you know getting assets, if you don't have a big background or just looking for something quick and you might want to, not wanna spend tons of time modeling a city in the background, but you might want it 3D for some reason, and you can use that here. So I'm just gonna quickly go over that. Here in the example scenes, for example, there's some motion graphic scenes, and there's just some just really incredible stuff that you can load up. You just double click it, it opens up the project. And there's also um, you know, some presets for things, but I wanna look at these 3D objects because there are just loads and loads of 3D objects that you can use here. And, um, you know, there are 3D objects like all over the internet. It's not that big of a deal. But what makes this pretty cool is using this with trap code. So as I go into buildings, there are three folders of buildings. I go in the miscellaneous and there's like this temple, for example. And this temple isn't really just this temple. If you know, like the stuff we were talking about yesterday with using 3D objects in form and particular in mirror, then these become potentially like an arrangement of particles in the shape of a temple or you know whatever else so you know keep an open mind about what you can do and also too when you look at like these houses or whatever you know i could just double click to apply one to my scene and i could just you know I'll just double click a bunch of these or whatever now if i want to qu quickly I'm, I'm gonna hit h on the keyboard to, to zoom out but using a cloner object i can select these and drag these and make these a child of the cloner and then I can go into my cloner and 
make a bunch of these. So by default, it's set up to use a grid array of these. And to make this go a little bit quicker, I'm going to change the instance mode. So this is done populating here. And I'm going to change this to render instance to make this render a little bit uh, more quickly. Wait for a second. And then uh, as I back up here, I can increase the size of the grid to increase you know, the area of these objects. And we can see more of them. So if you want to quickly create a neighborhood, you know, this is a great way to do it. it and also, too, especially if you want something in the background, um, this is really cool. If you're getting to... Um, much uh, like you can see that these this right here these tree ones are like totally lined up um, I can change the clones to random and it kind of randomizes the order and we have a little bit more randomization so we just wanted kind of like a neighborhood in the background and we wanted this to be like made out of particles or for some reason or whatever just be aware that it's not just the objects themselves it's what you can do with the objects and you know if I were making a commercial with a house you know, I don't know that I would use one of these models. I'd probably make something custom and on my own. But if I just want like a neighborhood in the background uh, and to be rotating in 3D space or something like that, I don't need a bunch of detail. You know, the, the content browser is a great way to um, to access that. In a little bit, a little bit later on uh, in this hour, we're going to be going to 3D objects volume two. And then in the weather section, there's a sun. And this is pretty cool because um, if I double click this, I mean, it's just a sphere, you know, it's nothing great, but if I go into the, like the luminance channel, for example, you can see that there's like a really cool map here. I'll right click and open the window and then I could resize this, but there's this really beautiful texture here. And so it's, the content browser can be kind of like a learning tool where you're kind of looking and seeing how a certain object was made and you could take the scene apart and uh, I find it to be really helpful. And we'll be coming back here again a little bit uh, later and using some of this stuff. Another great asset that we talked about um, in the, the stuff that we can steal from Cinema 4D or use from Cinema 4D, excuse me, uh, is that uh, the spline stuff. There's just really incredible tools for uh, creating splines, adjusting splines, and uh, it's second to none, really. Like there's no other like CG application or any application out there other than like a vector drawing application or something like that, but nothing in 3D that has the, the spline tools that Cinema 4D does. So for example, I could go to the spline arc tool. I'm gonna click my middle mouse button and I'm gonna go to an orthographic viewport. I'll just click on the top view and I can use the, uh, the, the, the spline arc tool and initially it's kind of weird because I just click and drag and it just makes a straight line. It's kind of weird. But if I go back to this straight line or any straight line drawn with any other spline tool, actually, I can click on this and create a spline, this like curved shape. And then I could go over to like this pie and then like adjust the shape. But I could also go over to a point here. And if I uh, click and drag, I create another spline. And then I can come over here, click and drag, and create another one. So in this way, I can create some really elegant stuff. And you might say, well, you know, I use Illustrator or I use, you know, whatever in After Effects. Or I'm just gonna hit Escape to stop this. And that's fine. Like if you use your shape tools, I'm not trying to like, you know, convert you to something else. But I I would recommend taking a look at what you can do with the spline tools here. Because number one, these splines can exist in 3D space. And we'll look at that again in just a moment. Um, and also just the way that you draw them, it's kind of meant for motion and for something else. Like in Illustrator, the tools are meant for just drawing a 2D thing. That's the final result. But these splines in Cinema 4D are, are meant to be means to an end. And therefore they can be kind of, kind of helpful. And um, I could also, I love doing this, I could go to the spline smooth tool, this little iron, and it's actually a really versatile tool that I can use to tweak existing paths. So by default, it's set to smooth. And so I can um, click and drag on an area here and smooth these paths out, which I usually have to do um, after creating a spline because I, you know, it's not perfect. It's not, ama it's not amazing what I'm doing here. Um, and I might want to take down the strength so I don't get like pure smoothing there. I could also uh, 
uh, increase or adjust the radius of the brush by my, one of my favorite things, I could use the, the Photoshop brush shortcuts where I could use the right bracket to increase the radius or the left bracket to uh, decrease the radius, which is cool. But this tool, despite its name of being the spline smooth tool can also do a bunch of wacky things. So I can take and I can uh, create a spiral with this. So I could just click on this and then it kind of creates this spiral and I'm moving my mouse around creating some other wacky stuff here, but I can inflate, I can pull, I can flatten this out if I want to. Uh, all kinds of really unusual wacky things. And you might be saying, hey, I thought this was on like integration with trap code, what's the deal? Well, keep in mind that everything that we're doing here can be used inside of After Effects. Uh, we can use this uh, mask, a spline, uh, as a, a path in After Effects to, well, to do a whole bunch of stuff that we'll we'll look at. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and delete that. I'm going to use one of the preset shapes. There's a bunch of preset shapes here. Um, you know, circles, arcs, and standard stuff aren't going to be super appealing to uh, After Effects users because we have this in shape layers, but Let's say, for example, I want to create a, a cissoid, and let's say I want to get this into After Effects. Um, this can be a little bit of a challenge, but I'm going to show you how to how to do this and then the benefits of that. So I've created a cissoid object, and uh, you might be saying, a cissoid, you know, who cares? Like, what about a strophoid? Bro, can you create a strophoid? And I could say, yeah, I could go down to my to my attributes manager, and there we go. There's there's a strophoid right there. So. <laughs> that's what your question was, then there's the answer to that question. Um, so there's all these things, cissoid and stro strophoid, you know, they don't, I don't know what those things do, to be honest. But this lemniscate, I don't know why it's called lemniscate, but it's an infinity symbol. So we do want to take this, I do want to take this and bring this into Adobe After Effects. So what I can do is actually go to my extensions and then go to CV Art Smart. And the purpose of CV Art Smart is really initially was to actually bring in stuff from Illustrator. Because right now, if you want to export a, a path from Illustrator and bring it into Cinema 4D, which is actually a really helpful uh, workflow, helpful thing to do, you have to save it out as a really old version of Illustrator that's very limited. So what CV Art Smart allows you to do is to import uh, more complex Illustrator files. But what we're going to do is we're going to use it to copy something else. Now, CV Art Smart is a plugin for After Effects. I tried really hard to avoid uh, plugins in this series of webinars. But CV Art Smart is a free tool that's available on Cineversity.com. If you haven't been to Cineversity.com, it's an amazing um, Cinema 4D uh, training site created by Maxon. And, um, and there's some paid stuff, too. And if you have a subscription to Cinema 4D, then all the premium stuff is free. But even if you don't, pay for anything there, uh, you can still get uh, CV Art Smart and a bunch of cool tutorials for free. So what I'm going to do is go to extensions, CV Art Smart, copy, that will copy this. We can't paste it into After Effects just by the very nature of the way the science works behind the scenes. But I can go into Illustrator. I'll create a new document. It doesn't really matter anything about the document. Google Pixel 2 is this preset it wants me to use. Sure, whatever, fine. Then I can hit Command V or Control V on the PC to paste this, and there's my path in Illustrator. Now we can copy and paste this path in Illustrator and take it into After Effects. So Illustrator kind of becomes the necessary middleman, the translator, if you will, that allows us to get splines from Cinema 4D into After Effects to wreak all the havoc that we're about to wreak um, in just a moment. But first, I want to show you really quick, if I click the uh, direct selection tool, I can see all the anchor points, and this is a lot of unnecessary uh, stuff. We don't we don't need all of this. So what I'm going to do is go to Edit, or no, excuse me, Object, Path, Simplify, and there's also a recent uh, update to uh, Illustrator dot release where they went in and tweaked this, so it's even easier, and the algorithm that simplifies stuff is even better. But I went ahead and just took this down to minimum. This takes my original hundred point path and takes it down to a much more manageable nine points and click OK. Because keep in mind, um, as we are taking this over into After Effects, these uh, points, each point, each uh, control point on the path becomes a keyframe if we're going to use this as the motion path, which we will. So having all of those keyframes, essentially, what will become keyframes can be uh, not super manageable, a little unwieldy. Wieldy. So I'm going to go ahead and select uh, this path, hit Command or Control C to copy it, 
Now we can go back to After Effects and I'll go ahead and open up this bad boy. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a new solid and I'll just call this mask. And then I can hit uh, Command V or Control V on the PC to paste it. And there's our Cinema 4D spline in After Effects. And now we can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. Uh, for one, I can create um, a light. I'm gonna create a spotlight, take out the intensity. And actually, you know, I'm just gonna create a point light. I don't wanna deal with all the point light. There we go. And then what I can do is I can hit P for position, select a position property, hit Command V. And now this mask that we just, or this path that we copied in, it's so confusing. There's splines in Cinema 4D. Illustrator calls them paths. After Effects calls them masks. You know what I mean. It's all the same. You know, it's the same thing. So you paste a whatever thing, spline thing, into the position property of the light, and it actually becomes a motion path, which is really cool. And the reason that's beneficial for us is that we can use this as um, an emitter for a particular and have it traverse this path. So I need to name it correctly for that. So I'm going to call it emitter. And then I can go ahead and make a new solid particular and then apply particular to this. And then, uh, you know, by default, the emitter is just like this point, right? And then I could go into the emitter and change the emitter type from point to lights. And then what I want to do is take down the emitter size to like one, just really small there. And let's take down the velocity a bit down to 50. And now as I preview this, you could see that my uh, particular is moving in the shape of this infinity symbol, which is really, really cool. So there's a lot of fun stuff we can do with that. I mentioned yesterday that I don't really use uh, OBJs in particular that much because you lose a lot of the 3D-ness because it's constantly generating particles. But using uh, lights or masks and paths, like our texts and masks, um, I find to be very helpful because there are more simple shapes usually, and you don't really need the 3D-ness. And so then you can create things like this where it traverses the path and has some uh, cool effects as well. And we'll be looking at another uh, cool advantage of this as well, because really the, the, the benefit, and I believe the reason why we can use lights as emitters in particular is because the lights became like a hack. You know, you couldn't use you could move three things in 3D very easily um, for as far as emitters go. And uh, with lights, they give you the ability to, you know, have more flexibility with moving the emitter in 3D space. And uh, again, we'll look at an example of that a little bit later. First, though, I want to uh, talk to you about another awesome tool called Trapcode DAO, T-A-O, T-A-O. And let me explain to you uh, what this is if you're uh, not familiar. It's another one of those ones. If you were there yesterday, we talked about Mir, and Mir is, you know, Mir is difficult to describe. It's like this 3D mesh thing. And DAO is also another one of those things that's just tough to describe. But in a nutshell, what it's doing, like keep it, I keep in mind that uh, DAO means path. The word means path. So basically, it's taking a path and putting actual 3D geometry on that path. And so we have three different ways to create paths up at the top. We can automatically generate a path, and there's three different options here. We can um, choose a circle, a line, or a fractal. And also we can use a, a light, a DAO light, and also we can use a mask to create a path as well. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to Path Generator. And I'm going to uh, turn off generate path because it sees the mask on this layer and automatically creates, uh, uses that as a path. So I can close this up and go down to segment. And this is where we adjust the, the 3D object. And this usually needs to be fiddled with. Like this isn't gonna you know, win any awards here. So uh, what I can do is, first of all, I'm gonna take down the size. Take down the size and that's a little bit more, a little bit more manageable here. Um, there's three options here in the segment mode. We can extrude a polygon like around the surface of the whole object. We can also repeat uh, polygons, and that's easier to see if I take down the number of segments. There we go. There's the polygons that are repeated. 
So we could take down the sides or we can take up the sides and make this a little bit more rounded if we want to. And we could also repeat spheres along this path as well. If we take this size down, you can see that we have these paths. It's really, that's kind of awesome. Um, so the, the stuff that you can do with this, it also Dow renders so fast and the intersections of the geometry become really beautiful. And I didn't mention this in the morning session, but um, if I go down to rendering and uh, usually I take super sample up to 4X or 9X to get like a more polished look. I can undo that for now though, but um, I really like in the shader section ambient occlusion. Uh, I can bump up the AO intensity and you could see like the shadowing happening here. And again, when we bump up the render quality, the stair stepping goes away, but um, we can create some really beautiful organic looks by playing with these settings. It's just a really potent effect. As Simon mentioned, I, I wrote the user guide for DAO and it's one of the most complex things in the world. So I, I feel like so much imposter syndrome because I understood it when I wrote the manual, but it's such a complex beast that I probably couldn't answer a lot of questions about DAO because there's actually like a series of codes that you could put into the name of lights that <laughs> change the behavior. Like the depth of DAO is like really interesting. I don't think like as a motion graphics visual effects community, I don't think that we've really plumbed the depths of um, what DAO can do and the power that it can uh, bring to the table because it's just such a robust Thing. Anyways, I'll take this back down to spheres and actually take this back to extrude uh, Engon and uh, give myself some more segments. So we have some more geometry here, maybe give us some more sides. This is rounded. And even that just looks really, really cool to me. Maybe even make some more sides. We could adjust the chamfer on the edges. It kind of has this chamfer di by default. So the edges are kind of smoother. Uh, we could also go down uh, back into our shader and change the drawing so this is like smooth so then we have this kind of like smooth look to everything uh, i'll go back to flat because i like that faceted look which is really cool um i could also again just like mirror i could add a, a wireframe and you know if you're feeling like a, this looks very familiar it, it is a lot of these settings material lighting texture shader the world transport visibility rendering it's very very similar to what we saw in mirror so as you learn one of these plugins it's like you're learning both of them so I can go in here and create like a different like wireframe color and play with like the size of that or um, whatever. And uh, it's anyways, really cool stuff. Um, in this case, uh, what I can do is go over to uh, Pass from Masks and I could taper the size and maybe take the, uh, the size down quite a bit. And then we have this elegant shape. And again, keep in mind, this is 3D geometry. So I could create a camera here and then, you know, orbit around this in 3D space because this is a three-dimensional infinity sim. And we can go into uh, DAO here and then adjust, you know, the start and end path and create these kind of elegant things here. And then I have a, an example of that here I showed you earlier. There's also a, a repeater built in. So I can repeat this shape if I wanted to. I could go into my re repeat paths and go into the first repeater and make some copies and then choose how I want to offset those copies. I don't want to dig too far into this, but um, you know, it's definitely worth taking a plunge down the rabbit hole and playing with DAO a bit. Um, there's reflection maps, and that's what I have going on here. There's like HDRI maps built into DAO, and that's how we're getting these kind of like cool uh, reflections on that. So anyways, some fun stuff to play with. And uh, that was just super potent. Okay. Um, let's look at a couple other examples. Let me just show you some examples of, of DAO that are already done um, playing around the user guide. So here's like the ambient occlusion at work. So just taking these objects and wrapping them around like a fractal shape and creating these blocks. And this is all live and it's you know, it, it, it animates, or it, I got like a little bit of evolution, I'd say. Um, as I adjust this, oh, maybe that's not uh, where I have that. That's interesting. Need to increase the amplitude as well, I think, on that one. Increase the amplitude. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. There's the amplitude. So I can make that stretch out. Yeah, anyways, Dow creates these awesome shapes. We'll look at another example tomorrow that's, that's really fun. Thank you, Simon. I love having you here. It's like the safety net. It's like when I first
forget to turn effects on or whatever. Um, but like, you know, we have the HDR reflections here and we have all this geometry with ambient occlusion and you can see how quickly this is responding. So this tool is just such a fun one to play with. Even if you forget to adjust the amplitude, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, there's a sci-fi tunnel that I made and, you know, you just take a shape and just repeat it a bunch into infinity and it's fully 3D. So it's, it's slow. It renders really slow in this case, because I have a lot of uh, repetitions of the camera that's moving, but um, it's fully 3D, as you can tell by it's kind of zooming in. This one, again, is a bit slower because I got more stuff. Um, there's also this interesting coloring system for repeating objects. So I have this, you know, um, noise gradient that I made in Photoshop, and I'm using that to color these um, repeating things. And again, this is all live in 3D and renders unbelievably fast. It's just gorgeous. Um, one other thing to play with as we're talking about splines and shapes and what you can do with them, you can use DAO lights. You have to name them DAO, like all caps, all caps, T-A-O. Um, and then you can use this as a generator in DAO as well. And it's really interesting how this, this works. So basically as I, I animated the position of this light in the shape of an R, and then I can take this path and then have DAO use that as the path and you'll notice that some of the geometry is like smaller here and bigger here and that's because dow if i go into pass from dow lights it can use the size from the radius so <laughs> the radius of the light as it scales down and then up is controlling the size of the geometry along this path not only that we can change the lights mode from entire path which just shows me the whole path at once and I could change it to build up. So now it builds up with the keyframes. Or we could change it to build up and remove. So it kind of picks up after itself. So it moves and then just kind of follows along, like it snakes along. So the reason why I'm showing you this and going into all this detail on Dow is because of lights and because of the path of lights. So this increases what you can do with these splines in Cinema 4D. So as we're looking at like the spline arc tool, for example, you know, it's not just about those like little curly cues and the squiggles. It's about being able to, you know, create shapes like this, like these, you know, pass for 3D geometry in After Effects using those uh, those splines. Really versatile stuff. Um, another thing you can do here, um, and those of you that are familiar with Cinema 4D, this is gonna be super old hat because this is a very common trick to do, but I can create a point light by clicking this button here in Cinema 4D. And with my light selected, I can go to Tags, Animation Tag, Align to Spline. And then in the Attributes Manager, where it says Spline Path, I can drag my Sysoid or Lemniscate or, you know, whatever you, Strophoid if you, if you prefer. Uh, and then, I can adjust the position value, and then that controls the movement along the object. Now you might be saying, uh, who cares uh, about that? And this is this is why this is awesome. I'm gonna delete the cystoid, and there are some splines uh, like Helix, and this Helix exists in 3D space. This is another benefit to, um, making splines in Cinema 4D that you don't have in After Effects or Illustrator is because, you know, we have this, the 3D-ness of this spline. And I can, you know, change the end angle, make this like so, or, you know, play with the, the angles and start radius. And so I can make this kind of like corkscrewy type thing. And then when I apply that same trick, line to spline, bring the helix in there, bada bing then the position it wraps around 3D space. Now this doesn't come over via Cineware. You have to use a different workflow, which we'll get into tomorrow because there's a little bit more to it than that's a little bit more complex, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. And so now I have this object moving around in 3D space along this spline. And then I could uh, bring this over into uh, After Effects, which I've done here. You could see that that's the, uh, the emitter. And then I could turn on Particular and turn on the effect. Thank you, Simon. And then um, 
I now have this, use this as a, as a path, and then we have this cool 3D pattern. Those particles are spinning out from that. And again, this is all 3D. So we have 3D particles in this kind of like corkscrew uh, type deal because of a line to spline, which is really cool. And then additionally, I could also go into DAO. I'll turn off the circle generator and then go into segment and I'll give this some more uh, geometry here. Do, 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 do. And then we'll also take down the size. And then what we have here is extruded 3D geometry. Zoom in, whoa, 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 whoa. Social distance, buddy. Um, so what we have here is actual 3D geometry extruded along a path that we made in Cinema 4D. So uh, this kind of stuff is a little bit more challenging to do in After Effects natively. And Simon, I believe you're gonna show a trick later about how to do this in After Effects. Um, so you, it can be done, it takes, it takes a little jerry-rigging, but uh, it's much easier to just uh, bring this over from Cinema and, and have this here. But again, the, the point is, is all the different ways that you can use this. Um, another thing to be aware of is that um, when you uh, copy and paste objects or, or paths, um, you can copy a bunch to one layer. And then if I'm going to use this, say, in form, for example, um, I can use uh, text and masks as the base form. And I have all kinds of awesome options including stroke edges sequentially. So I have just like, you know, basic, you know, cinema. This is like an early test, by the way. So don't, this isn't gonna be, this is not gonna wow you. Don't manage your expectations here. But uh, there's a bunch of uh, paths or a bunch of masks on this layer and um, I can stroke them sequentially. And so, and then I use like, you know, the repeater um, option here in, um, in form or whatever to duplicate this and you know, we can create interesting objects like so using these simple shapes in Cinema 4D. And again, if I pause this here and back up a little bit, like right here, you can see that this is actually just made out of particles. So I understand that like, oh yeah, you know how to, you know, use Vegas or stroke or whatever and like stroke paths, it's like no big deal. Even stroking them sequentially is not that big of a deal. But the power here is that we're using this inside of form. And so we have the fractal field and we have the ability to fiddle with uh, animation based on the audio and a bunch of other cool concepts that you know we don't have in other tools. So again, um, I, think that's, I think that's pretty great. Okay, let me show you um, the, uh, this text example here just very quickly. And we're doing great on time. So this is awesome, speeding right along. Um, so I have my text here, and this is, you know, a, a trick that uh, you may be aware of or, or not. I can change the render engine. If I want to use Cinema 4D power and ability to extrude text or shapes and then bevel them, I can do that uh, right here in After Effects without having to leave anything. So if I hit Command-K or Control-K on the PC to get my composition settings, I go over to, there's the basic tab, which is where you stay mostly and then there's the advanced tab and the 3d renderer you can change the render engine and um oh you guys remember the ray trace 3d um engine that was that was a debacle that was a a horrible horrible uh, event that happened anyway so now i could do cinema CS4 4D. That came in. yes right you remember that and like mm -hmm. it was so cool because like yay we finally have extruded te oh that's terrible that's the worst thing i've ever seen <laughs> um so now the cinema 4d uh, thankfully sends this back to the depths of heck where it belongs. And now we could use the Cinema 4D render engine. And when you do that though, you are going to lose a lot of cool stuff. So it's not something you want to have on like all the time because you're going to use lose blending modes and track mats, layer styles, and a bunch of other cool stuff. But you can adjust footage like this. You can adjust uh, text and shape layers and bevel them, which is really cool. So if I click OK, um, then the extrusions that I already set up uh, show up here and the beveling and I'll select my layer and type UU to show you this thing here. And uh, so you can see my extrusion depth. I could take this down to like 100 
and so we could have like just kind of like a smaller extrusion i have a spotlight pointing down on this scene and you're seeing like some vignetting on these edges happening coming from that and i also have a red point light at the bottom uh which is you know lighting the bottom of our text you're seeing like the bevels and the edges respond to lights which is great and we also have a bevel depth we could change the type of bevel to be like this traditional angled beveled edge and then i'm doing the concave thing which is kind of like this like little dip uh and then uh there's also convex the, the rounded kind of smooth edge or whatever we could you know adjust the bevel depth and this renders really quickly for 3d and after effects it's, it's pretty impressive so uh, this isn't really necessarily integration with um with cinema 4d except it's just kind of like built in so it's just something to be aware of um instead of doing a big round trip situation we could create some pretty cool effects with that by the way uh in the background here i have our uh, famous uh lemniscate <laughs> Uh, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. I don't know what that word means, to be honest with you. It could be <laughs> lemniscate, maybe. I don't know. Um, but do you know, Simon? Do you? No, I'm not going to pretend to know. We were okay. looking it up as well. The the one you had the other day had a, a Greek origin. So let's call it mathematics. Yeah, yeah. I looked up cissoid because cissoid was just kind of like the the easy one, you know, the is just kind of like the the first graders like seagull look, and even that was like unbelievably complicated. Anyways, um, so I have my mask here, I have Dao, and I have those going around in a circle, and I also animated a particular to kind of follow where the Dao is going as well. So we have this kind of cool look, and it I say cool look, and it's not that cool because it needs some pizzazz. And tomorrow we're going to talk about my favorite pizzazz tool, uh, the new Optical Glow um, that's part of the VFX suite. And if you're anything like me, you hear about uh, some third-party glow and you're like, uh, yawn, I don't care. Um, you're pr I was really good with stylized glow, been using it for like 20 years. <laughs> I'm good on my glows. Um, but ever since digging into Optical Glow, I've never used another glow and uh tomorrow i'm hoping to sell all of you on uh, for those of you that attend uh, i'm hoping to sell all of you on the powers of optical glow so i'm going to add some uh more glow to this scene and then we can uh, preview this and you could see the dow um, moving along the path and then also um, you'll see in a moment you'll see some uh, particles from particular being emanated from the path as well and so you can use these effects in conjunction with each other because, you know, we looked at form, DAO, particular, they all use masks. So they can be used kind of like in conjunction with each other to create these kind of like, you know, more complicated effects. And this is probably not a great example of more complicated effect. It's just like a little squiggly line and then dots flying off but you know the, you i imagine. think it's important i think it's important to also mention at this point that um you're using not the latest machine so you're getting not bad performance off a is it 10 years old graphics card that you're working with chad it's a the, the graphics card isn't that old the machine is 10 years old um Got it. Okay. the graphics card's only like four or five years old <laughs> but, but it's like it, even so, ashamed for my machine <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. But the, uh, if you like stack the, those effects like you have with a DAO and Optical Glow, they both render on the GPU. And when you, in fact, when you stack all your layers up with all the various GPU effects, you don't have to then individually configure your system for it. The, the plugins automatically use your hardware on your system. And so if you switched over to, for example, to a Windows machine, then it is dependent on the speed of your graphics card. So I think I mentioned this yesterday, but I'm using a, a Dell 7540 and testing it out against a pretty recent MacBook Pro. And the 7540 has got an NVIDIA RTX 4000 on it, and it absolutely crushes the Mac for performance. It's like twice as fast for doing GPU tasks. So the, uh, it depends how you're using stuff. And I also plug a, an eGPU into the Mac as well to test things out. But the, the takeaway is, as Chad says, you can just layer these up on top of each other if they're processing on the GPU. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I feel like self-conscious now working on my machine because 
you know, it's like the example of a terrible <laughs> machine. Chad here is using this garbage can. Um, and it's not even like one of those garbage Sorry. cans, it's like a pre-garbage can. It's like a, you know, metaphys metaphorical garbage can. Um, but it still, it still works. And I, I love it dearly. And it's going to have to go pretty soon because of... Anyways, okay. So I'm going to go back to uh, Cinema 4D and show you um, one other uh, thing here that we can use. Um, you know, one of the powerful things about, oh, by the way, I just created a new material, just double click in this blank area to create a new material. And I double click the material to open it up. Um, one of the things that's uh, really cool to me about uh, Cinema 4D is uh, the materials, especially the maps. If I go to do this drop down, there's all these really cool textures. You know, I first got into 3D um, a very long time ago. I don't even want to say how long ago because, like, you would think that I would be good by now after having been doing this for so long, and I'm, I'm not. So I'm not going to say it was a, it was a while ago though. Um, I was intimidated because you know you have to you know create maps and materials all the time, but all that stuff is like really built into Cinema 4D, and you know you can't get more than a tutorial or two into Cinema 4D before you learn about the the noise uh, texture here. And if I double click this, you know, there's tons of options. I go into the noises and there's all these different types of uh, noises, which are, you know, can do some really interesting things. And if I want to animate this, I just have to bump up the animation speed. I could right click on this preview, choose open window and right click on this and choose animate to see this, like what this looks like. Um, when it's animated, this looks very much like fractal noise in After Effects. That's not super impressive, but we have a lot of options here, and um, and this is a little bit more powerful than than what you would find in in After Effects. And so sometimes I find myself wishing that I had this in After Effects, and then I realized a, a pretty cool thing. So uh, I can get this in After Effects. So what I can do is create, let's say, a plane. And let's maybe say that it's like 2000 by 2000. So it's really big. And then I can go into an orthographic viewport, hit H to center it. And maybe I could even go into my render settings and in the output, change the width and height to match what I have in my texture, my, my plane here. Then I could hit H again. Uh, and then I could, with this view here, I could uh, click on the camera to create a camera view that matches. And if I click this little like square right here and get this white thing, then I will be in that view. So now if I were to take this over into After Effects, then the Cineware file would be the texture. So one of the things I did as I was playing around and that I'll show you in just a minute is I took off reflectance and color so I could just kind of get that texture as I wanted it. Turned on the luminance channel and I went into luminance and I went into surfaces Galaxy. A lot of these are, you know, deprecated. You know, a lot of these are kind of like not the cream of cream of the crop. But for some simple effects, they can still be pretty cool. So I use Galaxy, and you know, you could go in here and change your Galaxy settings. You could change the color if you want to, or like the angle, or like the spiral arms, or whatever. So I fiddled with this a little bit and uh, brought it over into into After Effects, and we'll see that in just a moment. But just be aware that, um, you know. Because you could bring in native C4D files, you can just set up a viewport and then bring whatever you want over into Cinema 4D and use it in unconventional ways like that. So what we're going to do is create a little eclipse scene using some of this stuff. I'm going to create a new solid. I'm going to call it Mirror, and I'm going to apply Mirror 3 to this. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go into Geometry. And we talked about yesterday, it creates this like mesh of geometry. I'm going to change the base geometry to an OBJ model. And it's going to go black because it's like, hey, where's the OBJ model, bucko? And so what I need to do is go into choose OBJ. And then I have, again, this huge library. And again, I could click add new OBJ, and it will bring in a custom uh, OBJ off of my hard drive. And then that will show up in my kind of like a uh, library in the custom section at the very bottom. If I actually want to use one of the presets, and I find myself doing this a lot. If I go down to the bottom here, there's some spheres that I can use. And be aware that there are two different spheres. So there's sphere and sphere smooth. Sphere, just regular sphere, actually is a little bit more blocky. You can kind of see some flat edges here. There's a little bit less geometry so that you can use this for like particular and form where you're not going to notice the lack of geometry, but you're going to be able to render things a little bit more quickly. But then in this case, 
um, I want to use sphere smooth. So there's a, a, the geometry is a little bit more dense and gives me these perfectly smooth edges because we're making a planet and we'd be able to see these jagged edges if they were there. So I'll click OK, bring in that sphere smooth. Hey, Chad. Yes. Hey, Chad. I wonder if you, for a moment you just click on that um, base geometry, that drop down link where it says OBJ model. If you could just click on that and hold it for a second. Um, choose OBJ? Or, well, just imagine just. Oh no, just the oh, one above yes. it, because I was just going to hypothesize, wouldn't it be interesting if you could see, say, use Cineware file in that menu? That would be an interesting thing to happen, wouldn't it? Just thinking that would be out loud. Amazing thing. That would be an amazing thing to happen. Um, so what you... if you had the, well, the trap code engineers talking to the Cinemaware engineers about that? So that's, <laughs> we are teasing, of course, because that's something that we're working on, and um, hopefully we'll see that uh, pretty soon. I just wanted to mention it whilst you're in here. Yeah, that's going to be pretty exciting. And also, too, another thing to mention is that, you know, it can we can use OBJ models here, but the process of getting an OBJ sequence, which we could also use, is really tough. So if we wanted to have a 3D object that animated, you'll notice that I didn't cover that yesterday, and I'm not covering it today or tomorrow either. Um, it's actually really challenging. But you can do it. You can theoretically bring in an OBJ sequence and then use that as an OB, uh, use that uh, for mirror or particular form or whatever. But um, it's really challenging getting that to work. There are a few plugins, and I did a bunch of research and I got some stuff in preparation for this, and none of them work. So um, it's, it, it's a challenge. So being able to choose Cineware would mean that you would be able to take animated 3D objects. And then use them in form and mirror in particular, which is gonna, it's gonna change my life, Simon. It's gonna change the quality <laughs> of my life. Um, so I'm gonna go into my texture layer here and our texture texture layer, and I'm gonna pick this uh, Venus map that I got from the NASA website, which is fan. It's a, such a great resource for doing space stuff like this. So then I have this cool looking planet. Now what I want to do is uh, make a light. And I'll just make a point light for right now. I don't want any fall off though, because I want to, you know, simulate like a sun, like a really powerful light source. So I don't want it to be like, you know, falling off. Um, okay, so I have something, and it doesn't look uh, right, obviously, because it looks like a bowling ball. Um, but it does look like a bowling ball, and that's kind of that's kind of cool. It looks realistic. Um, and so we're in we're in the right neighborhood. So I'm going to go back over to uh, mirror and go to my material settings. And this is actually not caused by reflection because there are, there are no reflections right now, but it's caused by the specularity. So I want to take down specular to zero because the planet is not going to be shiny. And now we have something that looks like I don't know, like it could be something from a nature documentary or something like that. It looks really cool. Um, and what I probably want to do here is uh, like one of my, the things that frustrated me most um, about this is that the, the smooth edges here. I mean, it looks really beautiful, but not really realistic because realistically, you know, the sun would be hitting this and it wouldn't be fading out on the edges of the, the light here. That's not how that would look. It wouldn't be that soft. Uh, and so what I can do actually here is go to diffuse softness. So the lights in After Effects, as you probably have noticed, are pretty limited, and we don't have like hard lights and soft lights and you know a bunch of controls like that. So uh, Mirror has us covered because we can uh, take down the diffuse softness and still create like a believable feathered edge because uh, you know we could take this down to zero and have like a really hard edge, and that's not great either. But as we take this down quite a bit, now we have something a lot more believable. And I just love that. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is play with the Z of this and actually probably take down the size of this a little bit too. And then now we have something that's starting to look kind of good. I like this. Um, another thing that I want to do here is I want to add a little bit of ambient light. And there's an ambient control in the material section, but it doesn't seem to do anything. I can't, um, I take it above 100%, it does nothing. I take it below 100%, it just doesn't seem to do anything. Well, what this is, it actually speaks to an ambient light in the scene. So if I create an ambient light, um, and I'm not gonna use, 
100% like a monster. 15%, there we go. Still too much. But what I can do is go back to mirror now that there's an ambient light and use this much more fine control to regulate the ambient light in the scene, which is really, really cool. So as I take that out, now we have something that's um, a lot more organic and beautiful. I'm gonna fiddle with this light again in just a second, but um, it's good for now. Um, let me go ahead. I'm gonna bring in our old buddy, Mr. Sun from the uh, Cinema 45. I'm just gonna bring in the C4D file right into this composition and there's our sun. And I'm gonna change the renderer from software to standard draft. Now it's obviously way too big. So obviously I would just hit the uh, S and scale this down. Uh-oh, that doesn't work. Or I could click and move this. Uh-oh, that doesn't work either. Look, I got this, this warning, this, this warning here layer size must match composition and use default transform values. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's angry, it's yelling at me, it's hostile. Um, so what I can do is actually override this, I'll undo this thing, and I could use the transform effect to get around the man and his crazy regulations. And I could take down scale to like 60, and I could then move this into place. And I have all my transforms like right here. Who needs the layer transforms? We don't need that business. Now, I want to um, make this sun a little bit sexier. So I'm going to add an effect called Ecto. This is in the universe collection of effects. And if I click on, um, well, look at that. Oh, So what Ecto does is that it creates kind of like this um, cloudy, thing, cloudy glow around something and can create some really interesting effects. It's cool for like creating like fiery type text or whatever, but I find that I use this in visual effects a lot because the, the textures are so organic. It's like even just the default settings, obviously the color palette doesn't work here, but if I preview this back, you can see that it's like growing in this like really cool way. I don't know. I think Ecto is an underappreciated uh, tool. So I'm going to fix this. I'm going to go to choose a preset. That opens up the uh, the Red Giant universe, universe dashboard. And just a quick little shout out for Universe. If you're not using Universe, I recommend going to the dashboard. You can also find that in Window Extensions, uh, RG Universe Dashboard. And just take a look at these different categories of effects because there's just so much to, to play with here. But I'm going to apply the Flames preset. And that's going to get us most of the way there. I mean, that's pretty cool looking and then what i can do is tweak this a little bit i'll go into glow settings and take the post glow down to what did i say 40 and then um, i like the blend better instead of color dodge if we take this to screen and there we go and i maybe this uh outer intensity is too intense tone it down just a little bit and now we have this like kind of cool glow i mean we could spend a lot more time fiddling with this um but i'm i'm not going to uh, to do that because that would just take too much time. But um, you could definitely play with this more, but we have this really cool kind of solar flare effect. Um, again, we could blur this and a few other things to kind of like soften this edge, but you know, we have a pretty cool sun effect, which is, which is awesome. Again, too big and you could fill with it, but that's good. Now, another thing that we did here is um, we are, I brought in the, the galaxy texture from uh, Cinema 4D. So it's just like I talked about where I used orthographic viewport with the Galaxy, blah, 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 whatever. And then I can take this down and bring this into my background here, scale this up because it's a pre-comp. So I get around the uh, the man's limitations again this way. And I can go ahead and, you know, dial back the opacity. I'd probably, you know, use curves to, to do this instead to darken this. But um, there we have that. Finally, um, Okay, we have five minutes. I'm gonna one last one last trick. Um, I didn't get to this in the last uh, session, so this is like a bonus trick. This is like my super quick uh, trick for creating star fields. Um, I use trap code form, and then I go in. I'm just gonna solo this for a second. Here's how, here's what I do. Uh, I'm gonna go into base form, and I'm gonna change the size because by default it's all linked X, Y, and Z. Uh, that's not great for this, so I'm gonna change this to individual. So I can control the parameters individually. I'm going to take the size to about the width of my comp. I'm going to take the size Y to about the width of my comp. 
could leave particle Z or size Z there. I don't need this many particles, I don't think. I'm gonna take down the particles in X and Y to about 40, 30 works too. And then I'm gonna go into disperse and twist and increase disperse. And then boom, we have a star field. And uh, to make this better, I'm gonna go into the particle section. I'm going to increase size random. I'm going to increase opacity random. And then just for some icing on the cake, I'm gonna go into the fractal field and I'm gonna increase the effect opacity value to about uh, 20 or so or whatever. And that makes it twinkle. So now if I preview this, we have uh, a really believable, quick, good um, star field that has some subtle animation in it that's not gonna you know, drive anyone crazy or call attention to itself, but still provide some nice life. So then if I unsoul this and then bring this in here, we now have our final scene and that's it thank you <laughs> that's not very that's excellent <laughs> no it's great it's it's almost like i can envisage a no light factory flare on there somewhere yeah it, <laughs> Future it, it, versions it, it of this. needs to be there for sure <laughs> absolutely i mean that's that's so great all those little tricks um, one, I mean, especially for the making stars and making them twinkle and, and so on, because and it's in a 3D space when you animate the camera, then it can react to it as well. So that, that's yeah. really handy. Uh, one concept or a question we're often asked is, why not do this all inside cinema? And I think Chad's demonstrating the, the sheer flexibility you have for multiple different workflows. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to see, so you're demonstrating now how you can all bit and then it reacts to it. This is great. Yeah. But it's um, sometimes just the number of iterations you can do if you're brainstorming with somebody, just trying out different ideas, or if you need to make a last minute tweak or change, then it's a, it's a much faster way of working. And, and everybody works in a different way. Some people know cinema better than After Effects and vice versa. So uh, I think what's interesting is having a look at your creative approach, Ted, and how you digest um, and interpret problems according to, for example, how much time you've got. Yeah. And by the way, there's a quick, there's a quick quest, couple of questions here for can we make the flares disperse unilaterally rather than go up and down? Yes, absolutely. The inside Ecto, it's all these flares are powered by fractals so that you can control the X and Y location of them and uh, then mess around so they don't have to go up and down thing as under under distortion there we go so we can change Prepare also it, the yeah. distortion settings and how they uh, how they are organized but um the and uh, the, the the distortion the size and, and so on so you can yeah, you can fiddle with that and uh, manipulate it so it's not always going up and down so they're straight so, i mean this is yeah sideways. absolutely so it's it's the aspect uh, uh property in the distortion settings in Acto, yeah. That's it, absolutely. So effectively, that's the X and Y controls. And that's interesting that you're looking at the pattern to, to kind of dictate whether it's a, <laughs> whether it's like the sun or whether it's a, a sci-fi, um, different type of sun um, or planet or um, or star, for example. Yes. But um, it's, I think that's the key, the flexibility of being able to jump to and fro and be able to set these things up and work quickly and then tweak them at last minute. I think that's fantastic. Yep. And in fact, to that end, um, I was, oh, I know we're up to time, but if you can bear with us just one or maybe two minutes tops, I wanted to actually steal one of your examples, Chad, and show, show how you can do um, some quick things if you are wanting to jump to and fro from cinema and use cinema lights for animation. Do so it. what I might theft, do. Theft is the, the okay. theme of the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like cheat, absolutely. So okay, let's um, make me presenter and show my screen, and then jump over to After Effects. And in fact, this is from one of your tutorials, uh, Chad. This is um, a a null which is has got two lights parented to it, and um, it's uh, uh, traveling up and down the screen and rotating is which is why these lights are then circling around it and it's using that technique that you showed earlier on if you go into dell and it use pass some lights um, it's using build up so that we can build up the geometry over time and a quick little point i think you mentioned it early earlier on that um, you can change the uh, 
the radius. Let's just move this up the screen here. Change the radius, and that changes the geometry. Yeah. So that you can then not necessarily solid geometry with the same size, and then you can also change the light. And because they're lights operating here, they can actually then change the um, change the color and also shine that light color on the other geometry, which is quite interesting. Uh, that's that's the background. What I wanted to show you was the fact that you don't have to have solid geometry. You can have things which are uh, much thinner, say. So if you wanted to resemble ribbons, let's just jump in here and change the shader from wireframe to fill and change the flat to smooth so it's not showing off the geometry. And in this case, uh, this, this was an example that I was chatting to a, a studio not so long ago. They had this scene where they had lots of ribbons that were being distributed into the scene that they'd animated in cinema. And they rendered them out and then comped them back together in After Effects. But every time they wanted to change something, they had to do a re-render. So what the, the, the idea was to then take lights from cinema, use that animation, bring them into After Effects, and then use those lights as sources for DAO so that you could then use those. And they're, they're in 3D so that every time you wanted to make a change, it was a quick thing to do even though you were using the information from the original cinema scene and they had tracked in um, some video footage and so that these paths were in a very specific location. So I think that's it's quite an interesting use of just being able to tweak things at the last minute and also do little things like this. If we jump into fractal displacement, rather than having 10 units on the amplitude, if we bring this down to zero, then we've got some really flat ribbons well they're not ribbons they're kind of paper ribbons i suppose paper chains if you like so there's that and they're being lit as you can see as they're going through by the lights that are generating the geometry so it's quite an interesting setup all the thing you can do with it but yeah. those examples were brazenly stolen from your um your <laughs> tutorials which are on the the red giant site or is it up here and under tutorials so if you wanted to check that out just type in dao and by the way, we're calling it Dao with a D because of the provenance of the Chinese pronunciation. But um, you can call it Tao if you want. We've heard people call it Teo as well. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter as, as long as you're having fun using it. And um, creating spiral geometries is, is a nice one to use. But the, uh, these, uh, these are the main three that Chad has recorded for using the getting started with Dao, and it delves into in a very short time a lot of in, uh, useful background information. And whilst we're talking about that, also I wanted just to let you know that if, say, for example, how long how long are these? I think they're 15 minutes that you got on here. Let's just quickly set this off. 17 minutes of amazingness. But what if you only had a few seconds to actually get some um, some kind of inspiration or a reminder, a memory jogger about what you can do. And that's why we've been setting up these 20 second tutorials. And I'll give you the link for this, but essentially this is a 20 second tutorial of generating 3D geometry from lights using DAO. And I'll just, I'll just mute this, here we go. So I narrate these and um, often we provide the project file downloads for them. But the idea is just to remind you, this is where that setting is, this is how you can do it. So it's a, it's a nice way of just um, remembering what's possible inside that effect. And that there's loads of them in here. I, I noticed earlier on you were talking about getting text and using 3D extruded text. So absolutely, you can do that um, inside After Effects, but you could also, another method would be to create your own um, OBJs and then use those OBJs inside Mir as well. And then there's some nice little presets to just instantly use reflection maps and change how that looks. And that's another 20 seconds of your life that you won't need to get back because it, it'll give you all that extra time to save to save on your production. But in any case, there, there's loads of ones here. And as you were presenting, Chad, I was thinking, I'm gonna steal a couple of those ideas for the uh, 20 second tips, especially that resize on the Cineware file. I thought that was very fun. Awesome. But and, in any case, we'll, we'll add these links to the notes. I'll just add it into the chat window here as well. Fantastic. And um, just as a reminder for the, the sessions tomorrow, I mean, we, we started off and I was just um, telling everyone about it, but here we go. There's, here's the, uh, the PDF. There's a link in the chat window to this PDF download 
of some of the exciting things that are coming tomorrow. Do, do you want to share any sneak peeks um, or, or rather just give a, a, a verbal um, advert for tomorrow's session, Chad? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to be looking at compositing a bit, and uh, we're going to be digging more into the actual like Cineware plugin. So there's like the ability to like you know do multi-pass stuff and to um, to bring in layers, and it's, sometimes it's not always clear how to do that or what you can do with that. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, the VFX suite a bit. We'll look at Super Comp, which is one of like the most amazing things of all time and uh, we'll look a little bit more at like dow and um an optical glow and making things beautiful so yeah i like that idea making things beautiful <laughs> it's interesting there's we've got lots of these tools where you can make beautiful things and you mentioned universe and there's so many glitches and adding texture and adding noise and so on so it's almost like um Track code and VFX are making things beautiful and the universe is making things look terrible. And we kind of need to do both in, in our workflows. They're both needed, yes. Absolutely. Yin and yang. But um, thank you so much um, again, Chad, for this. It's been lovely just to, just to have a peek into your kind of creative process and to share those tips that help you get those deadlines done. That's been fantastic. Thanks so much, man. It's been great. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, and thank you for the nice comments um, on the on the chat window. Thanks, Elio. Thanks, Onar. Thanks, Ellie, uh, Mark and Dale and Jed. We appreciate it. Thank you. And also thanks to Darren for answering the questions on the, the question area. And we'll be back tomorrow for some more of this. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, eight minutes overrun, but hopefully um, those extra things were useful. <laughs> we try and keep to an hour, but sometimes, you know, it's just not possible. But there we go. Anyway, um, please come back tomorrow and we'll um, cover some new new things, um, especially with the VFX. I'm excited for that. Awesome. But um, until then, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you on the next one of these. Awesome. See ya. Excellent. All right. Thank you. So, thank you so much. All right. Take care. Cheers. Bye.